back. Um, delighted to have Peter Bartlett, I think once I was his TA, uh, <laughs> talk about deep residual networks. Thanks, Thanks very much for inviting me. So, um, yeah, I want to tell you about some, some results on uh, deep residual networks. This is joint work with Steve Evans uh, here at Berkeley and Phil Long at Google. So I guess we're all aware of the uh, big successes of deep neural nets for uh, problems in computer vision, in natural language processing, uh, speech, game playing, all kinds of things. Um, I want to view, in this talk, view deep nets as a composition of nonlinear functions. So just think of for an M layer network, we can think of it as uh, a composition of M functions. Uh, H1 takes um, some uh, vector valued function of its vector input. Uh, H2 uh, is composed with that and so on all the way through to the, the output layer of the network where HM computes some vector valued function of its vector input. And for instance, we might have, you know, um, uh, sigmoid nonlinearities in this network. So uh, at the ith layer, the vector valued function we compute of this vector input x is take a linear transformation, right, and then pass that component wise through this sort of nonlinearity, right? So the ith output is uh, this squashing function applied to the ith input. Uh, or maybe we use, you know, if we're more modern about it, maybe we use a piecewise linear nonlinearity like this uh, ramp function. And then, and then uh, this thing is uh, called a ReLU um, for rectified linear unit. So again, we take linear function, pass it through that uh, scalar nonlinearity pass each component of this vector through the scalar nonlinearity <coughs> to compute our, our vector output of the function at the ith layer. Okay, so this is a class of functions that we're considering. And, you know, one of the key features here of uh, these approaches which have been so successful in practice is that we're considering deep compositions of functions. So m here is, you know, is a big number. It's not like uh, uh, 2 anymore, right? Uh, as it was the last time neural nets were popular. <laughs> so, okay, so what does depth provide us? Well, the, you know, the, the anecdotal evidence is that we're getting some sort of um, useful representations out of these deep networks, that early in the network we get uh, something that's, we, we get simple features of the input and later the, these things are composed into more complex features. Um, and, and so this is an effective way of representing lots of useful, useful features and of learning useful features. Um, you know, of course, it's important to think of it as uh, a non-parametric family, uh, although typically, you know, I've written this as, right, we have, you know, some fixed set of parameters, but think of the, the number of parameters here as large, right? This is really a non-parametric family, and that's how they're used in practice. As the uh, sample size scales, people are typically uh, increasing the, the richness of the parameterization, and you, and you get, you know, these properties that um, in many of these applications you can look at you know, number of parameters versus sample size, and those things scale roughly linearly if you look across, you know, many, many different empirical results. So it's best to view it as a, as a rich non-parametric family. Um, and within that sort of uh, uh, statistical approach, you know, having, having things composed is providing some sort of a parsimonious representation. Um, so, you know, it's been known for a long time, the approximation theorists have these great results about how nonlinear parameterizations uh, can give us much better approximation than, than linear ones. You know, going back to looking at splines with free knots versus any linear um, uh, kind of class. Um, but more explicitly, the impact of, of depth here, you know, there are these uh, explicit constructions of functions that require hugely more complex um, representations of this form if you use a shallow net versus, versus a deeper net, or even, you know, go one layer shallower you know, there are results, um, Matus, Telgarski and, and others have these examples where, you know, you need a much more complex network um, when you go to a shallower representation. So depth is providing something, uh, something in, that, in that sense. Um, but, you know, the flip side is what about the, the optimization issue, right? If we, if we have a, um, a training set and we want to choose parameters to perform well on that training set, you know, ignoring generalization issues, uh, having parameters appear non-linearly is an issue there, right? So um, we should expect that to make the optimization more difficult and we should expect it to get worse, um, at least at first glance, as the depth increases. 
Okay, so, and, and that's kind of a focus of, of this talk, at least some issues around that, around that point. Um, but in this talk, I want to I want to focus on a specific class of networks that have proven to be really successful in computer vision applications, so deep residual networks, uh, and talk about some representation properties and optimization properties of of that family of networks. So, what are deep residual networks? Well, here I've uh, shamelessly stolen a bunch of slides from uh, Kai Menger's uh, ICML tutorial. Um, uh, so, so here, this is, this is showing the history of a particular benchmark problem in computer vision, uh, the ImageNet Large Scale Vision Recognition Challenge um, uh, from 2000, going from right to left, 2010 back to 2015, uh, up to 2015. And um, uh, the uh, blue bars here are showing a particular um, measure of performance. This is the top five error rate in this um, classification problem. So small is good, um, smaller is better. And you can see there are two big jumps uh, in, in the progress on this particular benchmark. There was the jump from 11 to 12, going from shallow representations using things like hog and sift features, specific features, you know, appropriate for these, these uh, vision problems with SVMs and things of that sort on top, you know, ensemble methods, all sorts of things. But going from that sort of shallow representation to um, AlexNet, so a deep, uh, deep network here uh, with, with eight layers. Um, big improvement in, in accuracy on this benchmark, you know, steady improvements, and then another big improvement um, uh, moving from these nets to residual networks. And, you know, the other dashed line there is showing how the depth increased uh, across that, that same period. Uh, and increased enormously in moving to ResNet. So, you know, there are these very nice um, uh, sequence, there's a very nice sequence of images here. So this is AlexNet uh, 2012 and then 2014. There are these other two networks uh, and putting them on the same scale with this ResNet, you know, it's um, dramatic, right? So hugely deeper and, and uh, achieve this much, uh, this very significant improvement in performance. So what are, what are ResNets? So standard deep network, we're going to look at two layers at once, you know, and we'll see why in the ResNet case. Standard deep network, we just take our vector. Uh, so, so for a couple of layers, we take, take the vector input, compute a function by taking a linear, uh, linear transformation of that vector, and then pass that through those, let's say, ReLU nonlinearities. Right? And then take that vector, another linear function, uh, pass it through the ReLU nonlinearities. So let's call that h of x, that's a nonlinear function of, of x. This is the, the standard um, vanilla deep component of a deep network. So when we think about a residual network, um, in, you know, what's different here is just this shortcut connection. So think of the, uh, the input vector space here as being rd and the output as being rd also, same dimension, right? And, and these connections are, um, just the identity function. So what we're doing here in computing this nonlinear function of the input is take the input and add in the same sort of nonlinear function, right? In this case, it's you know linear combination of relus of a linear combination of the input. Okay, so but it's you know particular sort of nonlinear function um, uh, plus the identity. So uh, why is that significantly different from the, the vanilla deep network? Well, um, you know, one immediate observation is if you have zero weights in the two cases, what happens? Well, for a, for a um, regular deep network, zero weights, you compute a zero function, right? You're just taking this um, homogeneous transformation, nonlinear transformation of these linear functions, set the parameters to zero, you know, consider the zero linear function and the whole thing computes the zero function. But in the, the case of these deep residual networks, uh, setting the parameters to zero gives you the identity. Um, and that's something that we should be um, viewing as a, as a big plus because you know, having, some, having zero or small weights means we're close to the identity and identity connections are providing us with useful feedback right throughout the network. Okay, so um, typically these things are trained with stochastic gradient methods starting off with small values of these parameters. And if you think about what happens for, you know, parameters early on in a network like this, here's the input, 
here's the output, this is a, a plane network without those direct connections and this is a residual network, you know, what, what happens um, uh, to a parameter back here that's trying to decide, you know, should I be moving this way or that way in, res in response to, you know, this input and, and this is the desired output. Um, you know, of course, it depends on all of these near zero functions that are uh, composed in, in front of it, whereas the, um, with the identity connections, you know, you can imagine you're getting some sort of feedback from those direct connections from the, from the output. You know, that's the intuition, that's the, the argument that was made um, in the paper that introduced uh, residual networks, and there's empirical evidence to, to back up that sort, of, that sort of intuition. So here's a comparison on uh, uh, a small data set, Sidebar 10, a, a classification problem, um, looking at uh, just vanilla deep networks with different number of layers and, and residual networks. And the plots here show the dashed lines are the training error uh, and the solid lines are test error uh, on, on a validation set. Uh, and the different colors correspond to different depths of these networks. Okay, so um, uh, the, the, the bottom line here is for depth 20 and then 32, 44, 56 for train and again for test, you know, things go up in the same order, right? And, you know, that's sort of striking. It really points to a failure of optimization because, you know, we know with these networks, if we've got a 20 layer network, it can compute a particular function. Of course, we can compute the same function with more layers, right? Because we can compute the identity at, at any layer. So, you know, as we get to richer and richer representations, we're just not able to exploit that with the optimization. Question? Uh, networks is like an initialization of your deep neural network that works pretty well? Um, uh, it, that, that, I guess that's a way of thinking of it, yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, when you're working with a gradient, add a constant function onto it, you know, you're not changing any of the gradients. So that's, that's another, another way of thinking of it. Um, so the comparison of these, these networks with, with residual networks, again, um, um, the colors represent the depth and, you know, in this case, as the depth increases, the um, <clears throat> performance on training data improves and the performance on test data also improves. And this one's gone out to, you know, 110 layers, which uh, I don't think gave any useful, useful result in this, in this other case. All right, so su this suggests that, you know, it's optimization that's really um, playing a, a, a key role here. And these things were, yeah, question, Misha. Uh, I think that's, I think that's train, um, yeah, so certainly as training proceeds, I don't know whether they're talking about passes through the data set or, or what. Yeah, I don't know. You'd have to look up the paper. Sorry. But they're using mini batch. That I, I, so I believe they're both using mini batch and I, I suspect that this is showing the number of iterations of, the number of mini batches that were used for stochastic gradient. But, you know, I'm, uh, I'd suggest checking the paper, yeah. Okay, um, and, and these things were, you know, when they were um, introduced, very successful in, in these um, uh, competitions. So the ImageNet one, so this is a, a visual recognition and localization problem. You had to say, you know, was there a, a person or a chair and where, where are they in the, in the image? And, um, you know, much better than than any, any competitor, significant improvement over previous, previous years. And COCO, another, another competition. Uh, this one for detection and, and segmentation, and again, um, considerably better than, than any other approach. Okay, so, you know, why? What's, what's behind the success of these networks? What's important for their performance? And I want to tell you about a couple of results that are uh, little steps in that direction, I guess. Um, so first, let's, talk a bit about some intuition that comes from the linear case. So there's this elegant paper by uh, Moritz Hart and Tengu Ma, and they, they thought about this case of residual networks, where they said, well, what about uh, forgetting about these uh, awkward nonlinearities and think of just linear functions at each, at each layer, right? Suppose we throw out the nonlinearities and consider uh, a composition of linear functions. Of course, the whole thing is just a linear function, so it's a, uh, a very, uh, kind of convoluted way of representing a linear function, but let's, let's go with that. Um, so we can think of our uh, linear function, we could represent each, each 
the linear function at each layer by a matrix. The whole thing is just a product of matrices. That's the linear function we're computing. Um, and the result is that you know, if you have an invertible linear function, then you could write it as uh, a composition of linear functions, all of which are close to the identity in some sense. You know, the sense is that the spectral norm of the, the matrix, right, the difference between the identity and, and um, uh, what you're computing at each layer, uh, goes down like one over m, the number of layers here. Right, so if you get a deeper, uh, a, a deeper composition of these linear functions, um, then you can represent uh, your, your linear function of interest um, as uh, a composition of things that are closer and closer to the identity in the sense of the spectral norm. And you know, there's a little, uh, there's some fine print here about uh, a certain orientation condition. Um, the determinant of the matrix needs to have the right sign uh, to, to be able to, to make this conclusion. Okay, so that's, um, so that's one, uh, one result that, that they had in the, the linear case that, that you can uh, represent a, an invertible linear function as a composition of near identity linear functions. And then they had a, a, a nice consequence of that, again in the linear case uh, for um, the properties of, the, of a certain error landscape. So let's think about a problem of, you know, we have a linear Gaussian model, right? So uh, input vector x, uh, output vector y, they're both in RD. There's a certain linear relationship between x and the conditional mean of y, right? It's a, a times x. Um, and y is conditionally Gaussian, right, with that, that conditional mean and, um, you know, some, some uh, certain covariance. Okay, so under this model, you could think about what happens when instead of just estimating a linear parameter here, a single matrix, we consider choosing a, a composition of these linear functions, so a product of matrices, right, to minimize the quadratic loss. Okay, so the expectation of the difference between the outcome and uh, the linear prediction, uh, the, the uh, Euclidean norm squared of that difference. Um, uh, and the result is that if the spectral norm of these uh, matrices, these deviations from the identity, right, if the spectral norm is uh, strictly less than one, then every stationary point is a global optimum. So what does that mean? If you look at the gradient of this thing with respect to its parameters. So, um, you know, you could imagine writing out a, a huge vector of gradients with respect to every one of those parameters, right? Here I've written uh, blockwise, right, for all i for each um, uh, of these ai's, the gradient with respect to all of those parameters of this thing. If that's zero everywhere, so you're at a stationary point, then that implies that um, this product is actually equal to a, right? You've, you've uh, got the correct value of the, of the, um, uh, the parameters here. Um, so that's very nice. It tells you that, that uh, you can, that provided you stay close to uh, the identity everywhere, then uh, a stationary point is an optimum for this problem. Okay, so that's the, um, you know, that, that, that really fits in very well with the intuition you have about um, uh, the advantages of keeping things close to the identity, uh, that, that um, uh, you don't get troubled by um, local, local optima or saddle points. Yeah, nothing. So does this mean also that if I, I'm just trying to understand what, what it implies. I mean, it, it seems, and correct me if I'm wrong, it doesn't mean that I will, if I start close enough, I will actually go to this little bit of No. I could escape the, yes. this uh, ball. That's right. So it's not telling, it's not an optimization result, it's a result about this error landscape. It tells you that if you come across a stationary point in this near identity region, then that stationary point is necessarily an optimal point, right? It's the, it's the right value of A. Um, but, but you're right. It may be that if you follow a gradient, then you'll just get led outside this near identity region. Okay, so it's telling you about, you know, property of stationary points in that region. Bin. And this is independent sigma. If sigma is really, really, really big, things would go wrong. Um, 
No, actually, it's independent of sigma, and, and sort of for a trivial reason, right? Because we're looking at uh, stationary points of the expectation. And so we know we can decompose. We can decompose this into a bias term and a variance term. <laughs> Right? And so you know, the variance term can be huge, and it could lead to all sorts of issues. If we want to do things with a finite sample, it's going to you know, make it harder and harder. But you know, we're averaging all of those issues away. But the, the surface probably gets flatter and flatter, I would think. Um, you still have your conclusion. Uh, the surface is going to be the same, because it's an additive term that you, you're ignoring here. Right? When, you, when you get the gradient of this thing, you can express as a gradient of, of a, a bias part, which is how far this thing is you know, with an appropriate covariance in the middle there, but it's like just a quadratic form involving how far you are from A, the optimal thing, together with a variance term for the optimal thing. And that variance term, you know, will get bigger and bigger, but it's just additive. And so when you take gradients, it, it plays no role at all. Questions? Okay, so, um, so really the rest of the talk is all about um, uh, showing that those sort of properties are true in the nonlinear case, right? That you can go from, that, that you can make the same sort of statements when the functions you're computing at each layer are not linear uh, functions, but, but um, uh, nonlinear functions, Lipschitz functions. Okay, so the first part is, is about um, representing um, nonlinear functions uh, with uh, a deep composition of of, uh, of nonlinear functions. So, so um, you know, we're talking about a smooth invertible. Uh, this is the sort of hand wavy version, and I'll be more precise on the next slide. Right, so, so we've got a smooth invertible map. Um, uh, you know, the result is that if you want to compute that, you can spread that out across m layers, a, a depth m composition of nonlinear functions, so that all of the layers are computing near identity functions. If you look at the difference between that function and the identity, it's close to, in some sense. Uh, zero uh, and and you know goes down as something like one over m, the depth of the network, right? So you know rather similar to the to the linear case. So what is this norm? Well, this is actually a seminorm. Um, uh, it's the Lipschitz seminorm. It tells you that you know this thing, uh, the difference here should be should be uh, getting flatter and flatter as things get deeper. So um, you know this this uh, Lipschitz seminorm is the Lipschitz constant of of the, that function, right? Best uh, least value uh, that you can put in here. Um, okay, so as as the net gets, as the composition gets deeper, uh, you can you can get uh, functions that are closer and closer to the identity in the sense that the difference is getting flatter and flatter, right? These these nonlinear differences are getting flatter and flatter. So you can think of those maps, these HIs here as being you know, near identity maps that you might, you might compute them in this sort of a way, right? So we might have our squashing fun linear function of x, squashing function applied component wise to that, linear function of that, right? So these things are um, universal approximators and, and so as we allow um, uh, the inner dimension here to get bigger and bigger, we can, we can approximate um, you know, any, any one of these that, that we want in a, in a uniform way on a, on a compact set. Um, uh, right, so of course, you know, think of that as identity plus some nonlinear function of that sort. Um, and you know, punchline is as the network gets deeper, those the the non-identity part, the deviation from identity, can get flatter and flatter. Okay, um, so now to make that a little more precise, so our function we're considering only a bounded domain. Right, so there's some ball and everything we're interested in is contained within that ball. Um, the function H has to be differentiable. Uh, it has to be invertible, which is a strong uh, condition. It has to be smooth. Um, okay, so, so when we look at two places X and Y, the derivative of our function at those two places um, varies in a way that, that um, uh, it satisfies the, this Lipschitz constraint, right? The um, difference of the derivatives is bounded in norm by uh, some constant times the difference in those, those values. Um, and this is the induced norm, right? So we're looking at the supremum of these ratios. And these aren't, um, you know, we have to be a little careful about the definition. This is not, these are not linear functions. 
So it's, you know, it really is the, the ratio here um, for arbitrary x. Um, uh, we need h not just to be invertible, but to have a Lipschitz inverse. Okay, so, you know, again, this Lipschitz semi-norm of the, of the inverse of h is bounded by some constant. Um, we need this orientation condition again. So at some point, the determinant of the derivative uh, is, is positive. Um, and then we get the result that there are m functions that are close to the identity in this order 1 over m or log m over m sort of a way. And we can represent this, this h satisfying these conditions as a composition of these, of these m functions. Um, uh, and, you know, and in the big O notation, the constant here depends on uh, the, uh, the constants m and alpha and the, and the extent, the, the radius of the, of the bounded domain. All right, so that's what we can say um, in the nonlinear case. Let me give it, yeah. Do the h yeah. m's also satisfy the conditions? I'm sorry? Find the H1s for HM, do they also satisfy the conditions? Uh, they do. So, so actually, um, so these functions, you know, are, are not just, they're, they're smoother than just, uh, just satisfying this sort of Lipschitz condition. They're uh, as smooth as H, actually. And we'll see, we, can, we, we come up with an explicit construction for the H's. Um, so actually we can't because we want to think of things as being close to the identity, right? So think of the case where you're in three dimensions, um, you know, the identity has a certain orientation, right? And, and in that case you could negate one of your input features and, and then compute the function which has, you know, the right sign here, right? In, in, in odd dimensions anyway. I'm sorry? You can say that it's close to minus identity. You can, but you know, the, I mean, we're just writing a specific result here, right? You, you need to put a minus sign in somewhere. Yeah. Right? So the same thing is true, you know, trivially, if you replace h with minus h, then it's true for minus h. Right? But yeah, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a constraint here. It's not all, all mapping satisfying these other conditions. I think you've said this before, but why is it uh, advantage to be close to the identity? Of these layers? Yeah, so, so we'll see that in the second part, but the intuition from the linear case is, you know, again, this, this uh, result about the, uh, the shape of the error surface, that when you're close to the identity, then you have this property that for, for compositions, compositions of this sort, when they're all close to the identity, um, you know, we'll see that you have a, an analogous um, behavior of this error surface that all stationary points are globally optimal. So we'll see, we'll see something of that flavor a little later. Super. Last somebody, you can just replace h with minus h. Because That's what Misha was saying, yeah? For this. Because no, you, you cannot, because determinant oh, you cannot. will scale with minus 1 to the power d. Uh, in, so in odd dimensions, yeah. you can. Yeah. Yes, that's but right. Generically you have but to not in even dimensions, that's I think generically you have to work harder to handle the other orientation. Yes, yes. That's right. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's, let's have a look at the outline of the proof. So without loss of generality, we're going to assume that h takes value 0 at 0, and its uh, derivative at 0 is the identity. Okay, shifting things to make h of 0 equal to 0 doesn't change anything because, you know, a shift um, has Lipschitz norm 0. Uh, and um, <coughs> transforming things to make the derivative um, uh, equal to the identity at 0 is just a linear transformation, and we know we can represent those using near identity linear functions, right? So, you know, we're fine to make that assumption. And then, you know, now you can sort of see where, where this is going. We can do an easy transformation to get something that's close to the derivative at zero, which is the identity. If we think about scaling x just by this, this is a scalar, a1, right? So we take our original function a and scale it down by this constant and then divide by the constant, right? So as a1 goes to zero, we're computing something like the derivative at zero here. Um, uh, in, in that map H1. So we're going to construct our, our H1, H2, and so on, so that, you know, first condition, second condition is that the composition of H2 with H1 is another scaled version, right? Scale the input, scale the output. Keep on going like that all the way through to the end. 
and after m, a composition of m of these functions, we want it to be h of am x over am, so we better have am equal to 1, so that the composition is exactly h. And now we're just going to choose the ai appropriately, right? So the first one has to be small enough that we're getting, you know, roughly the identity here, the derivative at 0. Uh, and then subsequent ones have to be um, the, the gap, the, the difference between these, um, these AIs in going from something near zero to something that's equal to one, the difference should be small enough that um, uh, the transformation from here to here, say, um, um, is uh, close to the identity. Um, and then, you know, and that, that part's sort of easy and then there's a, a bit more work to show that, uh, that these functions are actually um, close to the identity in this Lipschitz sense. We have to work separately with what happens on small scales and, and large scales, where small means, you know, the difference between these subsequent um, parameters, uh, you know, if you're less than that value or if you're larger than that value. So there's, a, you know, a little bit of um, uh, ugly computation there. All right, so that's the, that's the key idea of, of that result. The punchline is that deeper networks allow us to have flatter nonlinear functions at each layer. We can compute uh, a function of this sort exactly using a composition of these um, uh, identity plus flat nonlinear function. Okay, and the second uh, uh, piece is, is the, um, this result about the error landscape for, for such near identity functions. Um, so here we're gonna think about you know, an XY pair Right, so inputs and outputs. Um, uh, and they have some fixed joint distribution. And we consider a quadratic criterion. So half the expected squared Euclidean norm of the difference between the outcome and uh, h of x. Right, so, so we're wanting to predict y um, using this function h of x. Uh, and, and this is, for, for the particular joint distribution that we have, you know, this is the, the uh, quality of of our function h. We can define the minimizer h star, the, the function that minimizes this quantity. Um, you know, that's going to be a conditional expectation uh, of y given x. Um, and you know, I haven't said anything about this joint distribution. We could think about it as just being uniform on a training sample, right? So all we're doing is empirical risk minimization when we want to find h star, or when we want to minimize this. Um, and uh, h star is, is some empirical risk minimizer. Okay, so now let's think about a function, h, that is a composition of m of these near identity functions, right? And I'll just write it as epsilon. Then what can we say? You can say, well, let's compute the derivative of this criterion with respect to the function hi. So this is a functional gradient, a fresh a derivative. I think I put, yeah. It's a fresh air derivative and we're, and we're looking at the, you know, induced norm of this linear functional, right? So we take the fresh air derivative of this criterion with respect to the guy that appears in the ith um, step of this composition. The um, norm of that linear functional, that derivative, is bounded below by something that scales as qh minus qh star, right? So if you're suboptimal, Right? If h is worse than h star, uh, then you know, your gradient is bounded away from zero. Okay? And this is showing, I guess, the uphill gradient, but of course it's a linear functional. You know, there's a downhill direction, uh, a function that, that when you compute this linear functional in that, in that direction takes you, takes you downhill and, and, you know, and it's steep if, if q of h uh, gets steeper as q of h gets further from, from q of h star. Okay, so what is, what is that saying? So if our composition is suboptimal and, and we have this condition that each hi is a near identity, now I skated over that, right? So these things are all epsilon close to an identity in this Lipschitz sense and we get, you know, the epsilon appearing here, right? In the, as, as epsilon gets, gets closer to one, uh, things get, get worse. Um, uh, then there's some downhill direction in function space. So the functional gradient of Q with respect to HI is non-zero. So every stationary point's a global optimum. There's no local minimum. There's no saddle point uh, within this near identity region in, in function space. Um, 
And actually, you know, from the proof, and I, I, I won't really go into this, but it turns out that, that it's the steep directions in, in the original function space, the space of compositions, that are providing a witness to the steep directions at every layer. Um, so, you know, just the sort of, for, formalizing just the sort of intuition that we, we talked about at the beginning for ResNets. Okay, so what does the theorem not say? It doesn't say that you won't have local minima of a deep residual network with a particular parameterization. Fix an architecture, you know, and, and uh, look in the parameter space. We're not talking about, you know, when you compute a gradient, it's a gradient with respect to something. Here it's, here it's a functional gradient. We're not talking about a gradient with respect to some finite dimensional parameter space. Okay, and, and you know, um, we should actually expect to have, to have uh, uh, suboptimal stationary points uh, for, for such parameterizations. Uh, and, we, and we can say something precise about that, at least in the sigmoid case. Um, so um, uh, what it does tell us is that, you know, uh, unless you're at the global minimum, there's some downhill direction in, in function space. But, you know, that direction might be orthogonal to all of the functions you can compute with this fixed architecture, right? Not true if you want to go to, uh, if you allow the, the architecture to, to grow, right? Um, uh, but for a fixed architecture, certainly true. Um, so as I say, we, we certainly should expect suboptimal stationary points for this sort of parameterization, but they're not arising because of interactions between parameters in different layers. They're arising solely because of what happens within a layer, because of the, the parameterization that you've chosen and the, and the sort of difficult properties that that, that imposes on the, um, the form of the error surface. Okay, so uh, that's the result. Now I had a little bit to say I have a few minutes. I had a little bit to say about the proof, um, just, just a couple of ideas really. Um, so, you know, it's based on the, the properties of these um, near identity maps. If you've got something that's close to an identity in this Lipschitz sense, let's say uh, closer than alpha, then it's necessarily invertible. You can bound Lipschitz constants of that function and its inverse, right? Um, uh, uh, in terms of how close it is to the identity. Um, when you consider the grad functional gradients with respect to, to uh, the argument of this function, so, so if we compute a composition of that function that's close to the identity um, uh, with some function g, and, and consider that thing, its functional um, gradient, so the, the fresh air derivative of that um, evaluated at g, that thing is close to the identity, that linear functional. Right, um, close in the in, induced norm, um, but of course it's a fun, it's a linear function, uh, and for any linear map, including including this one, the induced norm and the Lipschitz norm are the same thing, right? Because you're, you know, these these functions all go through zero. Um, okay, so so you know these these are the the crucial properties that let us uh, keep control of what happens um, before and after the the function that we're taking the derivative with respect to. Okay, so you know the the main main idea of the proof. First of all, we have projection theorem. So same as in the linear case, right? We we have that this uh, quadratic loss that we incur can be split up into, you know, the how far we are from the optimal thing, conditional expectation plus a variance term. You know, the the quality of h star. That's the constant there is actually q of h star, uh, and then. Um, uh, that means we can take the, the fresh air derivative of this thing with respect to the function uh, in the ith uh, stage of this composition, and we get something, so this ev sub x is the evaluation functional, it's composed with the derivative of the full composition with respect to that hi. And this is the thing where, you know, we're keeping control here of how close all of the, all of the pieces in this composition are to the identity, and um, uh, you know, we can actually explicitly compute this thing, explicitly plug in a function, a direction that we want to take this linear, evaluate this linear functional at, and, and um, set things up so that that has unit norm, and it's in exactly the opposite direction to the uh, way I've written it, same direction as this, right? So that actually, you know, the derivative um, evaluated in this, in this direction um, uh, gives us something that is uh, on, on the, scales as the excess here, the, the difference between h and h star, and that constant c 
is where we make use of you know, all of these properties of near identities to say you know, C can't be too small because we've got um, all of the functions in the rest of this composition being uh, close to an identity. So that's where these one minus epsilons uh, all pop up, pop up from. All right, so that's the, um, uh, some, of, some of the ideas of the, of the proof there. Um, I guess there are a bunch of you know, obvious questions here, right? So you know, we, we need this uh, assumption that the mapping is invertible, the mapping that we're wanting to, to approximate, uh, to, to estimate is invertible. Um, but you know, there are lots of cases. If it, th that, that requires, of course, that you're mapping from RD to RD. What if you do it solving a simple classification problem or something, right? You just want a, a single dimension. Um, uh, you know, what happens in that case? Well, it's, it's kind of trivial that you can extend it in that case um, to a d-dimensional mapping, and if, if you can come up with an extension that is invertible, right, that has this bi-Lipschitz sort of property, then, then, you know, of course you can represent things with flat functions at each layer, right? And it suggests a particular approach to doing that, that you're keeping your network uh, computing d-dimensional vectors all the way along, and at the end, you know, throwing away d minus one of them, um, uh, which might not be the first thing you would think of for such a mapping. Um, so, but of course, then what, what if it can't do that, right? What if you can't extend your mapping to something that, that is invertible and we really don't know? Um, uh, secondly, you know, what are the implications for optimization? Um, there are related classes that the optimization theorists have, have uh, uh, wrestled with. There's, there are these um, polyak yuryashevich function classes uh, that have some relationship between how far you are above a, a, a local optimum and the derivative that you see. And, and you know, there are specific algorithms for, for those classes that converge quickly to stationary points. Um, you know, they're not quite the same as, the, the, the condition that we have is not quite the same as the condition defining these classes. Um, and, you know, obvious question, what about the methods, the optimization methods that people actually use in practice, do they produce um, near identities? Um, Okay, and so I guess the two punchlines here are that, you know, in terms of representation, deeper networks are allowing uh, a lower representation with flatter functions at each layer. And um, under this sort of condition, if you restrict yourself to uh, flat nonlinear parts, I should say, right, the, the non-identity part, right, of these functions, if you, if you restrict yourself to identity plus something very flat, then uh, stationary points uh, are, are global minima. All right, thank you. I had one question about the previous slide that you just got out. Um, so here you're you're saying uh, no the I think uh, one before? No, no, the extension this is right. Yeah. So did you go back? So your original motivation was this sort of 152 layer yeah. thing. Did you go back and look at that and see if it can be? It, obviously, it's not convertible. Yeah. To see if to see if this really happened. So if you can extend it to an RD thing, right? Oh, okay, okay. So, you know, actually, it depends on which problem you're talking about. Some of these vision problems are naturally RD to RD. You know, if you're talking about uh, identifying a person in an image, it's, it's not a crazy thing to be, to be answering the question everywhere in the image and have, and have a map from, you know, one vector space to another vector space of the same dimension. But yes, lots of those, lots of those um, uh, problems are not of that, of that nature. Right. No, and and you know somehow you wouldn't you wouldn't really expect it, right? It it feels like it would it's it feels like a pretty strong condition to have to have to be able to extend your map to something that's invertible. But on the other hand, that was the whole motivation in some sense for. Yeah, yeah, that's what we can you know it's a small step as I said it's a small step, right? This is what we can prove something about, but it does seem like yeah, yeah. you know a pretty a pretty strong constraint. Yeah. So I was just wondering, uh, why wouldn't it work to just do the trivial thing, like put some of the inputs to extend H? Like we have a classification, we just add... Oh, in this case? Yeah, we just add... Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you, you can come up with examples where that doesn't work, but I don't know that you yeah. could show it would be true in general. I don't know, yeah, maybe that's interesting. We should 